suave, sexy, sophisticated. That's typically how we picture vampires today. Whether it's the high and mighty count brooding in his castle, or the dark and handsome stranger or sexy and seductive vixen brooding on the street, vampires these days are pretty hot and usually brooding. That wasn't always the case. The notion of blood-sucking corpses risen from the grave dates back to antiquity, and they were typically seen as monsters in the strictest sense, rotting shamblers more akin to what we today call zombies or revenants. So where did the notion of the handsome and cultured vampire come from? When did they shift from being human-shaped monsters to someone you'd want to bang? In today's video, I'll take a look at this phenomenon, particularly how literary trends shaped the sexy vampire as we know it today. Bram Stoker's Dracula, published in 1897, is thought by many to be the origin of the vampire as a gentleman trope. The title character and his vampire wives are sexy and seductive, exhibiting the kind of unrestrained passion that was absent from public view in Victorian society, not to mention its oblique takes on other taboo subjects like homosexuality and female-dominated relationships. But Dracula was the final product of not just thousands of years of mythology regarding undead bloodsuckers, like the Irish Autotok that I covered in a previous video, but also nearly two centuries of fiction that depicted vampires as more than simple monsters. The word vampire first appeared in print in English in the 1730s. Its precise etymology is uncertain, though it probably has Eastern European roots, as some of the first vampires, by that name, were from that area. German poets in the 18th century put these folktales into print, and though they rarely use the word vampire directly, they usually feature a lover or potential lover breaking the bonds of death. Heinrich August Ostenfelder's The Vampire, written in 1748, is a brief poem told from the vampire's point of view. It paints the creature as more than a mindless beast, seducing a young maiden away from her mother's charms. Christianity, in other words. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's The Bride of Corinth, published in 1797, also gives a short account of love lost, this time from the perspective of a vampire mourning, the bridegroom I have lost, and the lifeblood of his heart to drink. These works imply heterosexual relationships, but that is definitely not the case in Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Christabel. This longer poem, written around 1800, traces the story of a baron's daughter, Christabel, who finds in the woods a noblewoman named Geraldine. There she sees a damsel bright, dressed in a silken robe of white, that shadowy in the moonlight shone, the neck that made the white robe wan. Her stately neck and arms were bare, her blue-veined feet unsandaled were, and wildly glittered here and there, the gems entangled in her hair. Christabel takes Geraldine to her father's castle, where the two of them get naked and lay down together and, well, the next morning Christabel exclaims, sure I have sinned, so you can fill in the blanks. When Geraldine meets with Christabel's father, the Baron, he offers to aid her, but Christabel is starting to realize a spell that has been cast on both of them and protests. Coleridge never finished the poem. Was Geraldine actually a vampire, or simply a witch or some other kind of supernatural being? Regardless of her true nature, this work would have a significant influence on vampire fiction over the next century. 1816 was known as the year without a summer, and it was over three cold and rainy nights in June that a handful of friends gathered to Netflix and chill. Or they did the 19th century equivalent of that, which was to read scary stories and maybe come up with a few of their own. The host of this affair was the famous poet Lord Byron. The rest of the attendees included Byron's current paramour, Claire Claremont, along with her stepsister, Mary Godwin, and her lover, the not-yet-famous English poet Percy Bysshe Shelley. The fifth person in attendance was Byron's personal physician, John William Polidori. The group huddled inside Byron's mansion on the shores of Lake Geneva in Switzerland, reading horror stories, including Coleridge's Christabel, and proposed a contest to see who among them could compose the most frightful tale. The undisputed winner of that contest was the teenage Miss Godwin, whose novel, Frankenstein, was published under her married name, Mary Shelley. Byron produced only a fragment of a story, but that work was later adapted into a longer tale titled The Vampire. Originally attributed to Byron, it was actually written by his physician, Polidori. The Vampire relates the tale of the enigmatic Lord Ruthven, who is attended by a vain young man named Aubrey in hopes of imitating him. As they travel abroad, Aubrey develops concerns about Ruthven's behavior and abandons him. They later reunite, but Ruthven is shot and killed, enacting an oath from Aubrey that forbids him from telling anyone about his death for a year and a day. Aubrey soon discovers that Ruthven murdered two women, including one that Aubrey was in love with. He returns to England where his sister has just come of age. To no one's surprise, her primary suitor is Lord Ruthven, about whom Aubrey is unable to warn his sister due to his oath. 
Citing madness, he's sequestered from her and is unable to prevent the marriage of the two, who vanish just hours after the timer on Aubrey's oath expires. Published nearly eight decades before Dracula, Polidori's tale can be viewed as the true launching pad of vampire fiction. Just 12 weeks after its publication came The Black Vampire, A Legend of St. Domingo, which told the story of a Haitian slave who becomes a vampire and seeks revenge on his murderer by masquerading as a prince and marrying his killer's widow. In this case, the vampire is seen not only as a charismatic aristocrat, but also as a sympathetic character, similar to how zombies with their roots in Haitian folklore were also initially depicted. Another seminal work of the 19th century was Varney the Vampire, originally published as a series of pamphlets and later compiled into a single novel of considerable size, more than 200 chapters and 600,000 words. It follows the lurid and often incoherent life and afterlife of a vampire, or maybe he just thinks he's a vampire, in the early 1700s, or maybe 1800s. The work is often confusing and inconsistent, which isn't too surprising given its weekly installments in its original form, and the possibility that it had two authors, though that's been called into question. To give you an idea of its dual nature, one review I found called it a striking example of low-level popular fiction for the working classes and adolescents, while another described it as lumpy and inert as a sack of potatoes and as shapeless as a fart. Varney does provide us with a few elements that would be commonplace in later vampire works. While he is a blood-sucking rogue, he's also portrayed as a tragic and sympathetic figure who laments his condition to the point that he commits suicide by tossing himself into Mount Vesuvius. He's also the first vampire to have the trademark sharp fangs, giving us one of a vampire's most recognizable features. His name was borrowed by Marvel Comics to be that universe's first vampire, and there's a character in the Castlevania animated series named after him. Other 19th century writers, notably Edgar Allan Poe, created works that could be construed as vampire stories. These often involve people, typically lovers, coming back from the dead, though the term vampire is rarely if ever directly invoked, leaving their exact nature in doubt. In my opinion, the best pre-Dracula vampire work is Carmilla, written in 1872 by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Like Christabel, it focuses on a relationship between two women, one of whom is a vampire. Unlike Christabel, it's a finished work, and is a little less opaque in its descriptions. Sometimes after an hour of apathy, my strange and beautiful companion would take my hand and hold it with a fond pressure, renewed again and again, blushing softly, gazing in my face with languid and burning eyes, and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with a tumultuous respiration. It was like the ardor of a lover. It embarrassed me. It was hateful and overpowering. And with gloating eyes, she drew me to her, and her hot lips traveled along my cheek in kisses, and she would whisper, almost in sobs, You are mine. You shall be mine. You and I are one forever. Then she had thrown herself back in her chair, with her small hands over her eyes, leaving me trembling. The female narrator returns Carmilla's affections, though not without some hesitation, saying that she is drawn toward her, but there was also something of repulsion. Critics have interpreted this in threefold manner. The expected restraint of Victorian women from such a strong come on, the homosexual nature of the relationship, and the narrator sensing something of Carmilla's true nature. The title character shares many similarities with Count Dracula, who wouldn't come about until a quarter century later, and Bram Stoker all but acknowledged a link between the two in a prologue that was deleted from his famous novel. The short story Dracula's Guest follows a man who finds a beautiful vampire woman from the town of Graz in the Austrian region of Styria, the exact location where Carmilla is set. It was deleted from the Finnish novel, most likely because Stoker or the publisher thought it unnecessary. So why didn't Carmilla achieve the same fame as Dracula? As one person put it, Carmilla's subject matter is, a strong, intelligent woman is torn between her developing love of a mysterious, beautiful woman and conforming to Victorian-era oppression, while Dracula's plot is, a lawyer dude, a rich dude, a cowboy dude, a doctor dude, and another doctor dude who is also rich and a professional monster hunter, team up to defeat a monster and save two helpless women folk. The story has done better for itself in recent times, with loads of media based on the original story including comics, movies, rock songs, an opera, and various reimaginings, such as a web series that casts the two lovers as college roommates. Her character has popped up in a number of works, including video games like Castlevania and its TV series. I read the original in full while working on this video, and it holds up pretty well even 150 years after its initial publication. I've included links to that and some of the other versions in the description below, and I highly recommend you check them out. The evolution of the vampire from rotting to haughty was comparatively quick. Other types of undead are still typically portrayed as decomposing monsters, so why did the vampire get reinvented? 
Even in medieval times, vampire myths were spawned when corpses were exhumed and found to be unusually lifelike, even after resting in coffins for some time, making them ideal candidates for undead that could pass as alive. Also, when writers wanted to portray a kind of overt, if not toxic, passion, making the predator an inhuman, though still alluring monster, allowed them to portray the vampire's actions as something outside the bounds of polite society that no real person would do. Being a foreign noble with a thick accent, and a name like Ruthven or Dracula, also allowed the vampire to step outside the bounds of normal society. Of course, giving in to such sensual temptations would have been terribly inappropriate, unless your would-be lover is a mystical being casting a literal spell on you, in which case you can't really be held responsible for your actions. Vampire fiction was kind of the porn of its time. Today's media is much less squeamish, and so the vampire's sexual metaphorical acts, like penetration and the exchange of bodily fluids, face less resistance when replaced with the real thing. But in the same way that splatter-filled gore fests are rarely better than suspenseful horror, there's still something to be said for the innuendo of a good old-timey vampire story. And there are plenty of good ones out there, even if they're not as famous as Dracula. Thank you so much for watching this video about vampires. Please be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it, and feel free to leave a comment letting me know what you thought of it, or to give me an idea for a future video. Till next time, have a safe and happy Halloween, and try not to let strange pale women into your castle, no matter how beautiful they are.